I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you're safe, uh, sound, and above all, very healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual discussions, at least for now, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. I'm really pleased today to welcome uh, David Axelrod, a preeminent political strategist, former senior advisor to uh, former President Barack Obama, for a discussion of Ukraine and foreign policy, the Biden presidency, and whatever else we can throw in at the end. I, I truly, David, can think of nobody better to guide us through, navigate the ups and the downs, the twists and the turns, the ticks and the talks of a very complicated American political scene. But maybe um, you're very good at making things accessible. Uh, I think we'll all leave a lot smarter for sure. I make no guarantees on that, Aaron, because American politics is a very, very gnarly situation to, to navigate and explain right now. But yeah. uh, we'll, give, we'll give it a try. Right. And four decades in the business should give you uh, a, a leg up, I think, on the rest of us. Um, let me start by uh, suggesting that it's not that Americans don't care about foreign policy. It's not even about the fact that they don't have views. The Chicago Council on World of, uh, uh, continues to say every year that, that there is a, a significant interest on a part of, of Americans. But getting foreign policy into the category of making a difference when it comes to voter preferences and priorities is, is another matter. I mean, Vietnam, the Iraq War, 9-11, um, foreign policy came home and affected America's American views of themselves and the, their economic realities, uh, and Americans were fighting abroad. Um, Ukraine seems to be somewhere in between, an issue that Americans seem to care about, but may not regard as a, as a key priority. Um, can you unpack this for us, both generally on the issue of why Americans care or don't on foreign policy, and then go to Ukraine specific? Look, I, I, uh, I think that this waxes and wanes, you know, and, and that has been true throughout our history. Um, remember, we went through a period of great isolationism in the 1930s before the Second World War, and it took years for President Roosevelt to navigate uh, the U.S., uh, you know, in, into those conflicts, into that conflict, um, because of the strong isolationist sentiment uh, in the country. I think that you mentioned the war in Iraq. I think it had, a, 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 and Afghanistan as well, but I think Iraq in particular had a very strong uh, impact on the American people. Billions and billions of dollars of investment, uh, you know, thousands of lives. Um, and uh, there was a profound sense that it was a misadventure, a lost leader in some ways. Um, and I think it left people much more reluctant uh, to uh, be engaged, certainly militarily, overseas, but also, I think, turn, turned people's attentions much more inward. I think the most uh, powerful line that you could utter in American politics uh, post-Iraq was, it's time we focus on our own problems and our own concerns. Yeah. And, um, and I think that had a, a huge effect. Ukraine, I think, has inspired, uh, has captured the imagination of the American people because uh, of the um, you know, it, it's a it's a classic story. You've got the Russians on the other side. Putin, uh, you know, has uh, played the role of um, uh, of villain. The Ukrainians valiantly fighting for their freedom. It's a it's a kind of storyline that Americans naturally gravitate to. But I would I would add that um, you know, there's also every single poll you see is a deep resistance to any sort of American military involvement uh, in Ukraine. So there are limits to what Americans are willing to to, to do um, uh, in this instance. And, um, 
you know, my concern is that over the long term, um, even though there's strong public support for, for Ukraine, will people begin? And I, I saw actually President Zelensky in an interview with Time magazine express the same sentiment. Will people, <clears throat> will the American people and people around the world just start losing interest uh, because it's a lo- such a long running uh, saga? And um, I hope that's not the case. Um, but I, uh, this, this has been a, a real concern of mine for a really long time, the, the absence of belief that foreign policy really matters to us at home. And, um, you know, President Trump, I think, exacerbated this, uh, this notion that we can sort of pull up the moat and, uh, and we, can, uh, we can exist in, in splendid isolation um, is just not true. Uh, and, um, I think that we've had a, we failed and I've had these, I had these discussions with people in my own administration. Uh, uh, I think we failed to make the case effectively to Americans why what happens around the world is in fact a vital American interest, that it's not just a matter of, uh, America's beneficence, uh, but it's our national interest and our, our national security interests that are affected by things that happen around the world. And if nothing un, uh, should underscore that uh, more than the pandemic, uh, mm. you know, which has had such a profound impact uh, on our uh, on our country. But there are m- many other examples that you can cite. Anyway, that's a long answer to a short question. No, I mean, it, you know, it, Iraq and Afghanistan created a lot of risk aversion, uh, not just for the American public, but for administrations. Uh, and I think you you see that sort of restraint even now. And the polls continue to suggest that Americans want to do more for Ukraine, more aid, more sanctions. They draw the line, of course, at any uh, deployment of American forces or anything that would exacerbate a um, major crisis or escalation with the Russians. And it's clear Mr. Putin is counting on your concerns about uh, our sort of not having sufficient breath to follow through on this. Um, and well, you know, let me just interrupt you there, because I think he, he is counting on that. Uh, I think he's gotten far more than he bargained for, uh, though. I think he did not uh, expect um, the, the, the level of uh, coordinated resistance on the part of NATO. He did not expect uh, uh, Biden to react uh, as firmly as he has in terms of um, the uh, provision of, of, of aid, military and non-military. Um, you know, so I, I think, I mean, this is well-tried ground, but I think Putin miscalculated in many, many ways. Um, so, but, but on this point, whether, America, whether Americans would tolerate a military confrontation over Ukraine, um, that is something uh, that, you know, that, that may be a calculation he made, and he may have been right about that. Yeah. And, you know, wars have not been good to uh, uh, or kind to American presidents. You, you probably would have to go back to FDR to identify a major military involvement on the part of the United States that enhanced a president's politics and a president's legacy. And the Biden administration, I think, is acutely aware of that. But but speaking of the Biden administration, I you know, there's not, we, we spoke earlier, there's not much of a rally around the flag impact. I mentioned to you, I see a lot of Ukrainian flags uh, where before there were none. I see very few American flags. And I, I think the president's poll numbers have ticked up from February. I think he's probably in, low, in the low 40s from mid thirties in, in response to the question, do you approve of the president's handling of Ukraine? But the fact that Americans can understand or support our effort doesn't mean it's good for the president. You you gave an interview to the Chicago Sun Times, I think a day or two after the invasion, which you said that this could become a huge political problem for the president, given the already the trend lines uh, of spiking inflation. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that distinction between, yes, American support, but not necessarily good for this administration? Yeah, well, um, I'd say a few things about this. One is 
the thing that is driving politics, uh, uh, our, our current politics, as much as anything, I mean, I think there's a meta issue, which I'll talk about in a second, but in terms of tangible, specific issues, inflation is at the top of the list for, mm -hmm. for sure. That's how people are, you know, even though there's been enormous economic progress in many ways uh, in the last year and a half, and certainly in the last year, on this issue uh, of inflation, which is the one that people feel most intimately in their lives and touches everyone, um, you know, we are uh, we're not in a good place. And to the degree that uh, the war in Ukraine has uh, further um, exacerbated supply chains, for example, and other issues that, um, you know, certainly on energy, this is the case uh, that affect inflation. Um, you know, it, it contributes to the president's problem. He try, he's tried to make the point that there is a cost to this and this is part to, uh, to, to facing down Putin and this is part of the cost. But, you know, the reality is that we had inflation before this war. People mm -hmm. know that you can't over torque that because people will think that you're alibying. And so, yeah, I think it's created a problem for him. I think there's a bigger thing, though, Aaron, which is um, that, the overarching problem that Biden faces is that there are a lot of things going on right now that are largely beyond his control, but people feel them in their lives. You know, we're still coping with the virus and there's still uncertainty around the virus. Uh, we've mentioned inflation. Uh, you know, crime has uh, uh, been a real concern in major cities. We had uh, a shooting in Chicago over the weekend at one of at the city's most visited um, uh, sort of landmark location, the, the Millennium Park, um, in the middle of the evening on Thursday, on, on Saturday night, and and you know these things, uh, or I guess Friday night, um, this this is there's there's just a basic sense of unsettlement. There's a basic sense that things are not under control, that things are uh, chaotic. And, you know, even though I think Biden has handled Ukraine very, very well, um, we're still confronted with images on the screen of uh, scene, uh, scenes of terrible destruction and loss and suffering. And so there's another stalemate there that we can't quite get under control. Um, and so in that way, it contributes to a narrative that I think is hurting Biden. And I think it began, frankly, you talk about foreign policy, it began with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, and uh, which came at the same time that the Delta variant was kicking up. And there's just a general sense that things are out of control and, uh, and maybe he's not in command. Yeah. And that is what he is fighting. And to the extent that... Um, you know, there's no clear outcome in Ukraine and so on. It, even though he's doing the things he should do, um, it, it, it may contribute to that narrative. Yeah, I wanted to get to the issue of presidential messaging. And you've, you've advised presidents before. Uh, foreign policy was not a major uh, domestic issue for the Biden administration. I mean, maybe the Islamic State, the atrocities committed against American citizens brought some of this home. And that sort of dovetailed with uh, a number of homegrown terror attacks um, on, on his watch. But uh, I think you also uh, um, told the Chicago Sun-Times that it's important that the president explain to the American people why Ukraine was important and that they were going to have to deal with uncertainty. Um, and make sacrifice. Yes. And uh, how, I mean, how do you, how do you, I, I would give the president's very, very high marks on the diplomatic, mobilizing the allies, yes. marshalling the military systems. How do you think yes. the president has done on domestic messaging? Well, I think, um, you know, my, I think my comments came around the time of the State of the Union speech. And, um, you know, he did do, the State of the Union speech was a very odd speech because it came just as this Ukraine uh, uh, invasion was unfolding and 
Um, so they took a speech that was almost entirely about domestic issues and priorities, and they grafted about 10 or 15 minutes about Ukraine at the top, um, and then went back to the domestic priorities and never right. came back to uh, Ukraine. And I, you know, um, I thought that was a missed opportunity because I, that's the largest audience that he'll have, you know, this year. And um, he sort of half did what he needed to do at the top of that speech. But, he, you know, what he said was uh, there's going to be sacrifices involved, energy and so on. He said, but I'm going to make sure that you're not impacted by that is kind of what he said. Mm. That's the wrong. That was the wrong message. You know, the message should have been it's going to be it's going to be uh, there are going to be real sacrifices that we're going to have to make. And it comes at a very bad time. But let me tell you why we have to make those sacrifices. Yeah. Um, you know, he he needed a little more. Uh, I I sort of quipped that night on television that. Uh, you know, it was a Churchillian moment, but he he was more uh, uh, chill than than church. He needed to he needed to really uh, he needed really, I think, grab the moment and 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 be a kind of a wartime leader in that regard and and tell people this where, you know, the Ukrainians are dying for their freedom. We're not doing that. But we're going to have to make our own sacrifices in order to win this fight, because if we don't, this fight will surely come to us. And uh, I kind of missed that. Yeah. I mean, it does get to the whole question of what, what Americans expect from their presidents during a time of crisis, even though Americans are not deployed or in combat. Um, there's still an enormous amount of focus of the, on the president's time. Uh, on Ukraine. I yes. want to ask you about Afghanistan and whether or not uh, Biden's, I, I would argue, very competent leadership on Ukraine mm. has served to offset some of those images and pictures. You know, there's the old saw, you never get a second chance to make yes. a first impression. Yes. I don't think that applies to the presidency. I mean, I think presidents can have tough, tough first years um, and end up being reelected. They can even get hammered in the midterms and yes, end up. Yes, I, I, live, I, I, I can attest to that from yeah, first, first experience. Right. But so right. What, what, what do you think they want from, from Biden on this issue? Um, well, first of all, let, let, let's take your, your, your first point about Afghanistan. Let me, let me answer that question. Um, if you look at the polling there, you go, uh, go to Real Clear Politics, for example, and they'll have a long-term chart of the president's poll numbers. And it's like an X where the two lines crossed and his negative went up his, and his positive went down. And the, 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 uh, the center of that X uh, falls right in mid-August mm. uh, at the time of the withdrawal of the troops from Afghanistan and the kicking up of the Delta uh, variant. And he's never really recovered from that. Um, and, uh, and, and interestingly, I think the, uh, most Americans supported the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, but they didn't like the way it happened. Right. And, and, and he, I thought was, uh, too unwilling to acknowledge that it didn't happen the way it, it happened, that it shouldn't have happened the way it happened. And, uh, so in defending, um, what was obviously a desultory kind of uh, withdrawal, um, I think he further exacerbated his problems. Um, but, you know, remember, those were American troops, 13 Americans were killed. Um, and so, and the images of American planes with people hanging off the skids and, you know, those were, uh, those were powerful, powerful uh, images. And I, I don't know that this has erased that um, I agree with you completely. And I mean, I think we're lucky to have uh, someone who has the experience that he has uh, in the White House now, because uh, I think it's been extraordinarily deft the way he's held the coalition together. Uh, he's brought the allies along uh, much, uh, much further than anybody thought some of them would go uh, here. So he's really... Uh, 
I think he's really done a, a fine job on this, but it doesn't erase the image of what people saw. And, and the bottom line is um, there is this long-term question about command. Mm -hmm. And even on this Ukraine issue, I think wisely he has not been, um, he, he has, his, for diplomatic reasons as much as any other reasons, he's played a background role a lot of discussions behind the scenes, a lot of letting the Europeans take the lead on some things, uh, all the things that are appropriate. But there's nothing that I think erased that. He, he hasn't recovered from that. He basically has been mired at 42 percent approval rating uh, for the, like the last six months. And it seems kind of intractable yeah. uh, right now. If the economy approves, that might might change. But there is this larger dynamic and uh, the question he has to answer, which is, and you're, by the way, the border, if there's border issues uh, in these next warm weather months, that will uh, further mm -hmm. contribute to the problem. He, he needs to signify that he's, uh, that, that he is in command, that things are under or can be got, gotten under control. And he needs for political purposes to turn the election in November as best he can into a choice and not a referendum. A referendum, yeah. Uh, I want to uh, get your sense of bipartisanship. You know, having worked for Republicans and Democrats and voted for Democrats and older sorts of Republicans, um, it is interesting that Putin seems to have accomplished what no other American politician has been able to do. Uh, there's a, I described it a month or so ago as a fleeting moment of bipartisanship, but you know, you, you see these gigantic aid packages basically sail through Congress. Mitch McConnell was in Kiev yes. um, following Nancy Pelosi uh, several days ago. Yes. And McConnell is out there basically seeming to be a traditional Republican when it comes to foreign policy. And he's getting flack from, from the right and from the, the former president who described Mr. Putin's um, Military campaign as a as a as genius, genius. As genius. Yes. Um, but as we approach November, it, is this going to is this going to last? I mean, you you don't have any Bob Dole's or Dick Luger's on the Republican side, and you don't even have any Joe Biden's. I mean, there may be a few on the Democratic side. Can can this last? This sort of bipartisanship on Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, yes, I think it can last uh, because there are so many other uh, points of contention. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I think the Republicans would love to fight this out on domestic issues. Um, you know, and I don't think they think they've been helped. Look, I thought it was extraordinarily revealing that Trump called it genius that that when Putin inv in, invaded uh, Ukraine, because I think it it underscored um, what Trump Trump truly believes, which is he does not believe in rules and laws and norms and institutions. He believes that in a kind of Hunger Games view of the world, where the the the, the strong take what they want as and anything they can get away with, and the weak follow the rules and laws and norms and institutions. Yeah. And um, and I, I it, it 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 is bewildering to me why Democrats didn't take greater advantage of that uh, comment because he is also the front runner for 2024. And what does it say that he thought this invasion that Americans almost uh, unanimously revile was an act of genius? I mean, you know, the Tucker Carlson uh, amen corner uh, thinks otherwise, but um, this was just a tremendous blunder on his part. Uh, and, and a very uh, revealing one. But I, you know, I don't think that they're, the, I don't think that the, uh, I don't think that the Republicans are going to turn on Biden on Ukraine. I think they're going to batter him on inflation and the border and crime and, right. uh, you know, a, a series of other issues. So I'd be surprised if there were uh, a turn uh, on this. And the aid package that they just passed should, sustain them uh, for quite a while here, certainly four or five months. Um, so I don't know that there'll be other big battles 
uh, on this. So I don't expect Ukraine to be the thing that tears people apart. One last thing, you know, you say uh, Putin succeeded in doing what uh, uh, no Americans have been able to do, which is to kind of create a moment of bipartisanship. It's extraordinary. Not only did he create a moment of bipartisanship in the U.S., but he he re he revitalized the NATO coalition after you know it had been basically torn asunder by Trump. Uh, and so, I mean, just you just have to add that to the list of miscalculations that Vladimir Putin made. One last question on bipartisanship: There was a Washington Post poll, I think, in May that had seventy three percent of Democrats in. Uh, approving of Biden's handling, 40 plus percent of independents, and only 14 percent of Republicans approving, and 76 percent disapproving. Uh, how do you, and you know, in, in foreign po on foreign policy issues, since it's harder for Americans given the complexities of some of these issues, they take their cues from politicians and from the media. Um, unless maybe Fox News is part of the answer to that. But how do you account for the disconnect between the Republican elites being so out there supporting and, and these numbers? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, um, we, we are in a period of such tribalism that, um, you know, uh, Biden could announce a cure for cancer and right. Somebody the majority would, yeah. of Republicans would be skeptical uh, about that. So, you know, you have to you have to factor that in. Um, but there is a there is a Mitch McConnell does not represent the um, the base of the Republican Party. There is a right. nationalist populist base. Look what's happening in the Pennsylvania primary uh, that's going to be held tomorrow where, uh, you know, the, the, in both the governor's race and the, uh, and the Senate race, uh, you know, two strong candidates emerged who are, you know, f to the right of Trump uh, on, on uh, you know, issues like um, uh, abortion, who, who, are, who are more, uh, uh, you know, more vehement about the election of 2020 almost than he himself. Um, and who represent the sort of there is a very activist base in the party that, uh, you know, that is far, far afield from the Republicans that uh, that that, you know, and even McConnell. Um, and that's going to be a problem for them if some of these Republicans are nominated in a swing state like Pennsylvania uh, in the fall. But um, the Republican Party has has a huge problem in that, um, you know, the base um, is out of step with the leadership in a way that's really profound. Um, and that battle is going to be fought uh, from now through 2024 and beyond. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I, I know you're a, a, Demo a Democratic uh, um, student of Democratic politics, but you're also a student of American politics. I wanted to sort of pivot uh, to get any thoughts you might have on the state and fate of the Republican Party. I listened to Hacks on Tap, which is mm -hmm. a phenomenal mm -hmm. podcast. If anybody out, it's, this one was you, Stephanie Cutter, and Mike, Mike Murphy. Yes. And I think your Republican colleague, Mike Murphy, said that 75% um, of the base may well be with Trump, but there's a good 50% of in terms of supporting him as a candidate, but there are half of the Republican Party thinks he's sort of bad for business. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on, we're going to get to the Democrats in a minute, but I wonder if you have any yeah. thoughts on Republican messaging and um, um, their own particular strategy. I think you've referred to it earlier. Look, Aaron, uh, I think one of the problems in American politics is that we are so... Um, we're so polarized um, and we are siloed and um, the incentive structure is out of whack. I think it's uh, actually aligned with the out of whack incentive structure for uh, in media. But um, the way you get followers is to be 
is through outrage. And Trump, this was Trump's inspiration, and he has uh, profited from it. But look at the um, look at the people who are. I mean, the, the principal person who's emerged as a presidential contender uh, is Governor DeSantis from Florida, and he's done it by basically, um, you know, in, uh, latching on to divisive social issues, uh, you know, uh, don't say gay bill and his fight with Disney and, um, you know, uh, school masking and, uh, and, and he now I think is solidly the leading alternative to Trump uh, in the minds of Republican uh, voters. Um, That's what plays over there. And, you know, there aren't that many battleground states anymore, swing states anymore, in, and there aren't that many swing districts anymore. So, you know, in order to get elected, you've got to play to the, the base. And um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that for the Republican Party, I think, has been particularly difficult right now. I mean, we have this horrific situation in Buffalo, and I'll probably get myself in trouble here for saying it, but... Um, you know, and apparently what motivated this uh, this deranged shooter, I shouldn't say deranged, but this uh, sh- young shooter um, were uh, something that's become more and more mainstream in the Republican base, which is this idea of replacement theory that Democrats are trying to allow immigrants into the country in order to water down the vote votes of, of, of white Americans and uh, maintain uh, political power. And that's what motivated this kid. He, he wrote a 180 page tract on this or something. Um, and, you know, that's Tucker Carlson. That's, that's becoming more and more part of what animates uh, Republican politics. Um, so, you know, they have, ri- they have ridden the tiger. You remember, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy sent his inaugural speech in a different context about uh, those who uh, ride the tiger can end up inside. Yeah, uh, They're riding the tiger and they're going to pay, I think, a price for that in some of these swing uh, states. But right now, that's that's what's propelling Republican politics. Yeah. Switching to the Democrats, uh, Dan Balls has a terrific piece uh, in the Post on uh, uh, the midterms. It's a sort of a global examination of the issues, uh, priorities, uh, and the state state of some of the key races. But he quotes Sean Patrick Maloney, Democrat from New York, chairman of the DCCC, yes. who is saying that the problem with, with his party is that it's too divisive and it's too focused on what he describes as cultural issues. And the problem, he, he then goes on to say, is not with um, the voters, is with the party itself. Does mm-hmm. any of that ring true to you? Well, um, the, the problem the Democratic Party has is that it, it, liter- it really is a diverse, uh, a, a diverse party. And uh, keeping the sort of disparate elements of the party together under one tent was easy when Donald Trump was on the scene as president. Um, It's harder now. Uh, It's always harder to govern, frankly, when you're the governing party and especially when your party is, is, uh, is divided. uh, And uh, when you have very slim margins uh, in Congress, but there's no doubt in my mind that, um, Democrats were hurt by, um, you know, phrases that really didn't reflect in a, the majority of Democratic office holders and certainly not Democratic voters, but the defund police in 2020, right. um, uh, you know, uh, the discussions of socialism, which have, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of connotations for lots of uh, Americans. The, the, um, uh, you know, the championing of uh, inclusion, which I support and believe in, but uh, 
sort of morphing into a kind of identity politics that uh, that uh, creates uh, you know backlash. Uh, I mean, these are these are challenges for the Democratic uh, Party, and you know, I think the biggest issue going in the midterms is none of that. Although all of those have their uh, all of those are, are part of it. It's just, you know, you're the governing party at a time of 8% or whatever, 6% inflation, um, and things seem uh, sort of out of control. And the president's sitting at 42%. It's very hard to win uh, elections. I mean, it's almost impossible for the governing party to gain seats in a midterm election. It, it's only happened twice since World War II. Uh, but under these circumstances, it's 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 even more uh, difficult. So I think that's the main yeah. issue. But there are issues within the Democratic Party. I mean, my basic view of politics is talk about the things that have the broadest uh, appeal. And, you know, we won in, in 2008 with Barack Obama, uh, you know, obviously the first African-American president in the history of this country. We won the state of Indiana which hadn't gone Democrat since 1964, and it hasn't since. How did that happen? Well, it happened because he was talking about things that were broadly um, important to people. He was speaking in sort of commonsensical terms about the issues we faced, um, and he did not get caught up in uh, these kind of niche political issues. And uh, I think there's, you know, times are different. It's different than it was 12 years ago or uh, 14 years ago uh, and more challenging now. Uh, you know, whether we could have done that now, I, I don't know. But I do know the same thing pertains, which is, uh, you know, build your campaigns around issues that uh, have uh, broad appeal and meaning uh, to people rather than piecing it together. Now, let me just say, there is a counter argument that you'll hear, uh, mm -hmm. which is Americans have basically chosen up sides and now it's just a matter of, of um, provoking your base to come out in large numbers. And, you know, there's, there's an argument for, for that, but the, um, the meaning of it is that basically it's sort of Trump, Trumpism, you know, don't, you you you're speaking only to your base and you view this country only in terms of what your base uh, uh, believes and and wants and um, and you know I, I think that has uh, implications for us as a democracy that aren't very good yeah uh, since 1946 I think the average loss, for an incumbent party in a first midterm is something on the order of 25 or 26 seats. And as you pointed out, it's only happened twice. I think 1998 under Clinton and, and Bush 43. 2002, uh, after 9-11. Yeah, right. So a lot of this is already baked into the cake. Um, is the question then how bad is it going to be for the Democrats or, or and we haven't talked about it, and I, I don't want to go into it in great detail, but as a political analyst, there are new factors afoot. Yeah. Doom, at least one new factor afoot yes. that could um, create a different focus for the midterms from a referendum on Biden, on one hand, to a choice yes. between candidates or parties on the other. And that's the, well, the president will mention the word abortion, reproductive yeah. rights. Yes. How How, how is that? do you think how is that factor going to play we're way way we're light years away from foreign policy but it's politics and it's yes. important yes well um um I, I think you that is a great unknown honestly we first of all we don't know exactly what the final uh decision decision of the court will be right. one assumes that it'll be close to what we saw um I, you know, I was always one. I mean, this always came up as people were thinking about 2022 and could the Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade uh, create such a wave of of 
of anger and this and that that the unmotivated democratic voter uh, would come out in larger uh, numbers. I always thought it could, but I didn't expect the Supreme Court to to do you know to, to wholesale throw row out. Right. Uh, now it appears that they may wholesale throw row out and we've seen the reaction. Now it will obviously be even more pronounced uh, once the decision comes and the impact of the decision comes because you have all these laws, trigger laws in states where all of a sudden overnight abortion will become uh, illegal in, in some states, uh, even for victims of rape and incest. And I do think this will be a motivating factor and it will have an impact in some elections. Um, it's changed my view of, for example, whether Republicans will take the Senate or not. Um, I think it's a little less likely today as mm -hmm. a result of this. And a couple of prime, you know, the Pennsylvania primary, by Wednesday, I think we'll have a sense of who's favored to win that seat, which is currently held by a Republican. Uh, Republicans can't take over the Senate if they're giving up seats. Um, and in, in Nevada, there's a very uh, hotly contested Senate race. Um, uh, and uh, that race, I think, could turn on this issue. Um, so um, I, I do think it'll have it can have an impact on the Senate race. I, I don't think it may reduce the Republican uh, yield in the House. But remember, they only need five seats to take five over. Seats. Right. Uh, so you, you gave the average number. It's it seems highly unlikely that Democrats are going to be in control of the the House come uh, January. And that has all kinds of implications for President Biden. Right. We're almost at the end of our 45 minutes. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question that would require uh, a course at the University of Chicago to answer. <laughs> but five of the last six presidents spoke about unif unifying healing, bridging, bringing the country back together again. Biden most recently, before Biden, uh, Obama, uh, who said there was no red or blue America. Right. right. There's only the United States of America. Now we've, there are other points in our history where we have not lived up to our name as the United States of America, but things are really bad. Um, in 1960, 4% of Democrats and Republic of Democrats and Republicans, in answer to the following question, would you be unhappy if your daughter or son married someone from the opposite party? 4%. Today, according to Pew, 35% of Republicans and 45% of Democrats said they would be unhappy. So I'm not going to ask you to uh, what can be done about this. It's a cosmic galactic. I call it the well, cosmic. The last two minutes. I, I yeah, I, I call it the co the cosmic oive question. I mean, it yes. really is something that worries me greatly. But can you leave us maybe with some measure of hope? Yeah. Well, Aaron, you know, I, I always say that, that democracy is an ongoing battle between hope and cynicism. Cynicism is sort of on the march right now. Um, but I do think that there is a, there are a large body of people out there. There is a large body of people out there in this country, uh, who are weary of this. And, uh, you know, and the question is, can they be galvanized as a political force? Can they be encouraged to participate in party primaries? But, uh, because that's where the action is. Um, but, um, I, I think, I'm looking for leaders who are willing to try. I'm looking for leaders who are willing to galvanize uh, those people who uh, live between the poles, who aren't so uh, mired in their media silos that uh, they 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 don't see their fellow Americans as uh, as enemies. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really struck by some of the rhetoric, the political rhetoric now. Um, of, uh, uh, I forget who, I guess, uh, uh, Representative Biggs in, in the uh, Republican caucus. This was reported in the book, It Will, uh, This Will Not Pass, that Jonathan Martin and uh, 
and Alexander Burns from the Times just wrote, but in the caucus at which um, they were, I guess, confronting Liz Cheney, he said, you know, uh, basically you can't, these are not our opponents, you know, these are, these are our adversaries. And, you know, if we let them win, they will change this country forever. And, and that is, that on both sides is a growing sentiment. And so um, if that prevails, you know, we're going to be ungovernable. We're not going to be a democracy or at least the democracy that we, we purport to be. Uh, and we're going to see more incidents like January 6th, and they're going to create counter uh, incidents. And, um, you know, so I, I mean, I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Believer, and it was a, not about any candidate, but about our system here. And I still choose to believe, but, I, but I'm not Pollyannish about it. It's going to take real effort. And leaders of great skill and, and uh, persuasiveness to step up and galvanize Americans who understand that this is not the future that we want. Yeah, I mean, I think if each of us could turn that M and me upside down, so it's a W and we, if there was a lot more of that, we'd be in a lot better shape. Well, you know, the, the, we, we had our, our slogan during the Obama years was, yes, we can. Mm. And the we was in there for a reason. Right. Uh, we is a very important word. It is. And uh, we have to find our common humanity and our common uh, investment in each other as Americans again, or the consequences are going to be really great. Yeah. David, after all, I want to thank you for coming on Carnegie Connects. You've made all of us, uh, I, I will speak for, um, I will say that a lot smarter. Well, uh, thanks, I appreciate thanks. your expertise and your, your, your passion. Well, and, and likewise, thank you. Good to be Take with care. you. You too. Bye-bye.